So now after Deuteroisaiah, we know that Deuteroisaiah was during the exile. Now we have to begin preparing ourselves because we're not going to be in exile forever. How long are we in exile? Only some, say, 60 years. 598 began the first deportation. Jerusalem rebelled in 589, fell in 586. 538, they're going to let us back, go back home. So we're deported a thousand miles away, say to Phoenix or Chicago or San Luis Potosi. 60 years later, we have to make the decision. Cyrus is letting us go home. Do we want to go home? Should we talk about that context? So prophecy didn't end during the exile. In fact, five of the 15 latter prophets would be post-exilic, meaning written after the exile. Five prophets after the exile. What does that mean for us tonight? We have five more prophets to go. In the Bible, we have the first and the second book of Chronicles. We said that this Sunday, the first reading is going to be from the second book of Chronicles. It's those two books of Chronicles, then, that detail what's happening during this time. The challenge is, is the Bible a book of history? Not a book of history, it's a book of theology. Saying how it is that God is active and working among us. What does that mean, then, when they try to start writing down history? The history is sometimes going to be confused. Follow me? It's not, it's not a history book. But what we are led to understand is that the Babylonian Jews departed from exile. Cyrus is now letting us go home. So under the leadership of Shezbazar, a good Babylonian name, interesting because Shezbazar then, probably a name of a second or third generation Babylonian Jew. So now, this is not someone who remembers this time so much. This is someone who was the child or the grandchild of an exile. So Shezbazar, Shezbazar is going to lead us home and is going to serve as prince and governor of Judah and help to lay the foundation of the temple, according to the book of Ezra. Ezra and Nehemiah say that some 50,000 people came home. Is it likely that there were 50,000 of us that came home? No, because you know what? After 60 years in a place, got a nice home here, got a nice job. Why am I going to go back to that city? <coughs> right? So the initial numbers that, that trickled back was likely much smaller. Uh, why do we say that? Because we know that it took 25 years to rebuild the temple. Think about it for a moment. If 50,000 of us came back at the same time, I've got to imagine the temple would be rebuilt in a bit more than 25 years. Follow me? So we're thinking that it wasn't quite 50,000 who came home. The Persian Empire had a system of satrapies, or satrapies if you prefer. So it was almost like provinces, if you will. A satrapy is like a province where the center of that satrapy or that province then, for instance, we were the satrapy of, of the trans-Euphrates, simply meaning there's the Euphrates River. We were the satrapy that was beyond the river. And our, the center of our satrapy was in Damascus, according to the book of Ezra. Each satrapy enjoyed a fair degree of autonomy so that our satrapy here in the trans-Euphrates could issue its own coinage. We did our own policing. We collected our own tributes and taxes. We were our own province, if you will. Cyrus allowed us to rule ourselves. He had a large enough empire. He wasn't micromanaging his empire. He, ruled, he allowed us to rule ourselves so long as we were loyal to him. Uh, anthropologists have discovered a clay cylinder from that era that says what Cyrus did. It says, I returned to these sacred cities, the sanctuaries of which had been ruins for so long, and established for them permanent sanctuaries. I also gathered all their former inhabitants and returned to them their habitation. He let us come home. He helped us to rebuild our temple. He's helping us to restructure ourselves again as a people, so long as we're loyal to him. Ezra, the book of Ezra, speaks of this royal decree of Cyrus. Have historians found this document? Not yet. So, we all had the option in exile to be able to return. Many chose not to return. What were some of the decisions that, what, what were some of the reasons for which they decided not to return? Because many of them made a new life in Babylon. They were prosperous. Why take, why take the chance of journeying back a thousand miles? Are you really up for walking a thousand miles this month? What is that worth to you? 
right? Why undertake that journey which could be dangerous? Why go back to a place that's less sophisticated, where life is difficult? Remember, where did we learn to write? People, we learned to write here in exile. Did we have any writing? Did we do writing back in our home place? No. Why do we want to go back to that primitive place? Let's stay here in Babylon. Interestingly, the Persian Empire sponsored and subsidized and restored local cults, which simply meant that King Cyrus wanted people to have their gods. He wanted people to be happy. So he, got, he helped people to build their shrine to Marduk in Babylonia. He gave them their moon god in Ur. He gave them their Yahweh cult in Jerusalem. Ooh, do you see what's happening? He's allowing people like us to have our own gods. Right? So long as we're loyal to him, nothing wrong with worshiping Ur, or the moon god, or Marduk, or Yahweh, so long as you're loyal to the king. Now this becomes interesting because we learn from the Babylonians how it is that we can write these things down. Here in exile, we're writing down our rules about how we're going to live and be separate from people, how we're going to be holy. And so now we, have, we, we learn from them. Remember in Babylon, we saw this uh, law code, Hammurabi's code. What does that mean for us? We're going to write our own law code. What do we end up calling it? The Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And our writing down those books of the Bible, that could not make Cyrus happier. You follow me? Cyrus now sees how it is that we've organized ourselves as a people. We have our own laws. We're governing ourselves. Our laws, the Pentateuch, right? The books of Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, those are all of our laws. We're organizing ourselves so, so, long, so long as we pay what we need to pay to Cyrus, we're going to be okay. That raises a question, how are we going to pay what we need to pay? Well, what about this system? What if we just all pay 10% to the temple, and then we'll have enough to be able to pay off our obligation? What do you think of that way of organizing ourselves? The rebuilding of the temple was carried out in response to prophetic preaching. So voices like Haggai and Zechariah, whom we're going to be hearing about later tonight, they were all about rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the temple. It was almost like they were hired by the king to be able to say how, to get people excited about rebuilding the temple. The government restored the temple priesthood in Jerusalem. <coughs> because we have to remember, priests were, were powerful people. So Cyrus is going to let priests be in control here in Jerusalem so long as they are loyal to him. But then there become questions. Now that we're going back to Jerusalem, certain questions like, should these Jews of the diaspora, these Jews that have been exiled, be allowed, who, are, are they real Jews? The argument was being made that those are the real Jews who are coming back to establish the temple call. How it is that they alone remained faithful. Of course, that was oversimplified by the chronicler. Haggai is going to tell us how it is that ritual purity demands membership in the Jewish temple community. If you want to be holy and set apart, what does that mean? You have to be part of this temple society, offering sacrifices and all. Who do we include and who do we exclude? What about people like idolaters, people who turn to, to, to worship idols and other gods? Do we let them in? It's going to be a question that divides us. Resident aliens, pagans, eunuchs, right? Who do we allow to or not to worship our God? It's going to be interesting because... Different people are going to say yes to different people, and other people are going to try to exclude them. So, for instance, the book of Deuteronomy excludes eunuchs. Eunuchs are men who don't have everything that other men have, so they're excluded from worshiping Yahweh. Deuteronomy says exclude the eunuchs. Book of Isaiah, chapter 56, true to Isaiah says, hmm, let the eunuchs in. We're going to have these questions of whether or not to exclude different groups of people. Ezra and Nehemiah, for instance, had a problem with people who married women from other cultures. What's the problem of marrying a person from another culture? Then we're no longer holy or set apart. You're mixing us with them. Remember our clothing? We don't wear cotton poly. We wear clothes that's made out of one thread. If you are cotton and your wife is poly, no, no, no. Your children will be cotton poly. You follow me? We're not a cotton poly people. We are a cotton people. 
Avoid the poly people. <laughs> what, what did Hitler do centuries later? Was it, what was Arianism all about? It was about the purity of a race. Craziness. Use it for power. That's it. Question. So who's asking, are you Jewish enough? Now, the people that stay or the priests that are coming to control? Both. So what's happening is we have this conflict because we have the people who are not deported who remained in the land. And now we have the people coming back who under Cyrus's authorization are reestablishing the temple called and saying that they are the true Israelites. Wait a minute, people. You're people who mixed in with these other gods and have these other stories that are not calling yours stories of floods and sea monsters? Y'all are bringing these things back now? No, 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 no. Y'all who intermarried Sheshbazar? Sheshbazar, what is your name? Right? You're Babylonian. You're not Jewish. 